Welcome to the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Today we are celebrating our 20th anniversary of being a commission within the vocational rehabilitation field. I'm going to give you a tour of the Lincoln District and the Nebraska Center for the Blind. Follow me. To this building, we have our Lincoln District. Our Lincoln District is full of field staff who will come out and do intakes with new consumers and work towards their employment and educational goals. Here at the front desk, we have Riley, who possibly could be your first contact when you call the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired and look into receiving services from our agency. And that phone number is 402 471-2891. As we come down the hallway, we've passed the offices for the field staff. We've passed the Lincoln District Conference Room. And we've passed the Lincoln District Kitchens, where some trainings will go on. Here we have the Lincoln District Kitchens where some trainings might go on with field staff and consumers of the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. We might bring some students or some consumers in to work on home management lessons, uh, Braille lessons, and so forth. And as we continue down these halls, we enter the Nebraska Center for the Blind, which is a rehabilitation center where students could come and live as residential students of the Nebraska Center for the Blind. We are a residential agency, as I said, and so our students will attend the center, but they will also live in apartments downtown where they get to reinforce the techniques that they learn here in our five areas of instruction. And those areas of instruction are technology, orientation and mobility, braille, home management, and shop or home maintenance. So let's continue down the hall. Technology class. Hello. And we have Kelly, one of our students working So Kelly is working on JAWS. JAWS stands for Job Access with Speech. It is the primary screen reading program used in professional settings, business settings. We also teach voiceover, which comes on iOS or Apple products, and TalkVac as well, which comes on Android products. These are what we call non-visual techniques for technology access. Continue down the hall, we come to our Braille classroom. Okay. And in our field, we still talk about Braille is literacy. Braille is not a foreign language. Okay. Braille is a tactile code of the English language. So we still like to enforce Braille because Braille can be used in many different environments. Braille is still a good tool to use in the workplace uh, when pursuing your education. There's also many areas in daily living where Braille can be used. It can be used to label products in the kitchen, label medications, uh, label different uh, pieces of entertainment, whether it be uh, DVDs, movies, things like that. So there's still many uses for Braille in daily life, especially in education and in the workplace. You may notice that our students are wearing a blindfold, which we call the sleep stage. We are a structured discovery center, and we have two key tools that we feel are important in our training. One is the long white cane, 
and the other is the blindfold or the sleep shades. Again, here at the Nebraska Center, Center for the Blind, it's very important that we teach non-visual techniques. So this is our shop where we teach home management. So while students are engaged in home management classes, they get to learn different things throughout their time here. They might learn how to change light bulbs. They might learn how to patch drywall. Uh, they learn non-visual measuring techniques. Uh, they get to work on uh, you know, fixing toilet problems. And as they're doing this, they get access to different tools, whether it be a drill press, a radial arm saw, a table saw. And they learn the non-visual techniques with these power tools, where towards the end of their training, they'll then get to build a shop project where they put all their, their techniques together to produce a product. And uh, we've had different things come out of our shop, from jewelry boxes to a desk uh, to an herb garden. And all of our students get very creative with the, the projects that they produce. But the important thing is the confidence that they learn by learning how to work with all these power tools non-visually. Many of our students, when they first get to the Nebraska Center for the Blind, they've never held a cane before. So they start off with some basic elementary techniques with proper form, proper posture, and cane technique. So they might begin their instruction working with our orientation and mobility instructor with just learning techniques, walking up and down the hallway, and building up that sensitivity with the cane and understanding distance and proper cane technique. And again, you'll see that our students are using the long white cane and the sleep shades to reinforce those non-visual techniques. So with that, I'm just going to, to say a few more words and then we're going to start introducing our uh, speakers. One of the phrases that I remember the most um, when I do my job is, power without wisdom and love is a waste of energy. And our speakers today, besides the power they, they have, <laughs> They're very wise people, and they show passion and love for what they are doing. The 100 years of public vocational rehabilitation, 100 years ago, it wasn't the way how it was. In fact, blind people didn't qualify for public rehabilitation back in those days. Blind people were considered disabled too severe and a lot of other areas too. The way it evolved was because of consumers, people with disabilities, pushing for the change. The same thing happened with um, 
the ADA, and even before the ADA, we have in the blindness community what is well known as the White King Law. Blind people organized themselves and wanted to make sure that they have access to all public areas, the right to use their canes, to work with the uh, guide dogs wherever they needed, and the right for employment. Then became the ADA, but again, people with disabilities work very hard for years to come up with that law. And then 20 years ago, we have the creation of the Commission for the Blind. It wasn't easy. I remember I came in 1998, and I heard all the history of it for years. Consumers in Nebraska were working to create this Commission for the Blind. And as a blind consumer, I joined the effort. So it was, it was nice to get there and, and help to push it. But as we know, all the law and services could be worthless without passion and without involvement. I'm going to be asking Mr. Jason Jackson, who represents the governors. He, he's the HR liaison with the governor's office and also the director of the uh, Department of Administrative Services. If you could come, Jason. We are working with the Department of Administrative Services to create new jobs for blind people. But I'll let him give some of his remarks, and then we are going to jump into the next uh, speaker. And I want to start by acknowledging our host, Carlos, thank you for your leadership. Uh, you've been a leader in this agency since 1998, over 20 years of service to the state of Nebraska and to this agency in the last three years serving as its director. Uh, so just thank you for your leadership and your partnership. And I'm going to ask those in the room to join me in a round of applause for your leadership. <laughs> Governor Ricketts has declared this month, the, uh, has proclaimed this month, ne the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and the Visually Impaired Month. And so it's my pleasure and my honor on behalf of the governor to go ahead and read that proclamation now uh, before proceeding into some uh, brief remarks. The proclamation reads, whereas blind Nebraskans knowing that they could best be served by a freestanding commission with a consumer-driven board, tirelessly worked with elected officials for many years to improve services for the blind, first from the Department of Public Institutions and later from the Department of Health and Human Services to create a separate agency for the blind. And whereas the Nebraska legislature and Governor Mike Johans ultimately listened to their blind constituents and passed legislation to create the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And whereas, on July 1st, 2000, NCBVI officially opened its doors and began serving the blind of Nebraska. And whereas, NCBVI now has a 20-year history of providing nationally recognized vocational rehabilitation and independent living services to blind Nebraskans through the agency directly answerable to its blind consumers. Now, therefore, I, Pete Ricketts, governor of the state of Nebraska, do hereby proclaim the month of July 2020 as Nebraska Commission for the Blind Month in Nebraska and call upon all our citizens to recognize the successful partnership between the commission and blind Nebraskans as we celebrate NCBVI's mission of empowering blind individuals, promoting opportunities, and building belief in the blind. All right, thank you. And uh, Carlos, I have the official proclamation here. I'm, show, I'm uh, holding it up to the audience now, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and hand that directly to you. Thank you, sir. There you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, I am just honored to be here on behalf of Governor Ricketts and help the Commission celebrate this milestone, help us acknowledge 30 years of the American uh, with Disability Act, 
the 20 year history of this specific agency and all of the work of everybody here in terms of uh, uplifting uh, the blind community and helping them to fully participate in society. It, it occurred to me uh, coming over here today that right now in current events, you know, there's really a, a national moment about lifting up voices that often aren't heard, about a national movement about access to services and, and rights and equal protection. And this is an agency which for the past 20 years uh, many of those under Carlos's leadership have been lifting the voices of blind Nebraskans and helping them to fully participate in society and, and be a part of that conversation and that movement. So it's just an absolute honor to be here and what an honorable uh, mission. From the Ricketts administration's perspective and my agency and administrative services specifically, we take a great deal of pride in our contribution to that effort. Um, and our partnership with Carlos and his team. You know, we've, uh, through our uh, Task Force for Building Renewal, have invested over $6 million over the last couple of years in accessibility to state infrastructure uh, for the blind and the disabled community. We have our ADA Task Force is administered out of uh, the Department of Administrative Services under the leadership of Gloria Ed Edens, advocating for accessibility and accommodations uh, for both the public and our teammates and state government so that they can fully participate and serve uh, their communities and their constituents. And so it's, it's really an honorable mission and one that we're proud to be a part of and proud to partner with. And, and most recently, we enjoyed the partnership of the commission uh, with respect to expanding opportunities for uh, blind businesses and contractors with the passage of LB 220 last year, spearheaded by Carlos. Uh, introduced by Senator Anna, Anna Wishart and signed into law by Ge Governor Ricketts, which expanded the Nebraska Business Enterprise Program and has directly contributed to the expansion of uh, blind vendors taking over uh, vending opportunities in, the, in 12 of Nebraska's correctional facilities in the past year. So a great success story. And we know there's much more work to be done, and it's a journey that continues. Um, even now, there's work that's ongoing. Uh, to expand uh, opportunities with respect to technology, uh, technology accessibility. And that's work that's, again, being led by the Commission and partnership with Administrative Services, our procurement team, the University, and, and many others to try to expand opportunities and accessibility and, uh, and really just create the customer-focused state government, which is at the core of accessibility um, and really just, in, in, again, creating opportunity for people to engage and benefit from their services across Nebraska. Uh, Carlos, it's been an honor to meet your team today and to be uh, come and for you to host us. Um, truly an inspirational mission, an inspirational facility, uh, one that Nebraskans across the state can take great pride in, uh, the services and the mission that you and your team are delivering upon and uh, one that we're proud to have a small part in contributing to. So thank you for the in invitation today. Congratulations on 20 years of outstanding service to blind Nebraskans, and congratulations on having this month declared uh, the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired mm -hmm. Month across the state of Nebraska. So well done. As a lifelong blind Nebraskan, my personal relationship with the State Agency for the Blind here has been a long and winding road, intertwined with that of others, some of whom were more pivotal in bringing what we are celebrating here today into fruition than was I. I think my journey can illustrate, though, why we brought this commission into being and why it does well to partner with those it serves. My first connection occurred over half a century ago, <laughs> when I wanted to go to college at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Upon graduation from high school, from the School for the Blind. Several of us, including my sister Lauren, just a year older than I, attended there at the same time. We sometimes found ourselves at odds with agency personnel about policies regarding our education. One such issue concerned the payment of readers, people we hired, mostly students, to read and or describe materials 
not available in Braille or other accessible formats. The agency helped with this using a sliding scale. Because seniors made more per hour than freshmen, we were encouraged to hire freshmen. We often found ourselves negotiating about time, money, and our education. We argued that hiring someone who could deal efficiently with materials, sometimes taking fewer hours at a higher rate, not only could save the agency money oh, yeah. <laughs> short term, but also could truly assist us in getting an education worthy of the expense. Shortly after graduating from college, having applied to and been rejected for several teaching positions, I agreed to work on contract for the agency. I was naive when I moved from contract status to full time, accepting that the reason I was making less was that there wasn't an opening for what I was specifically doing. When a sighted person was hired to do the same thing I was for more money, I started to realize that perhaps what blind folks I thought were exaggerating were saying about discrimination based on blindness was true. The day the director called me in, asked me to braille something for him and read it back, and said in amazement, that's exactly what I told you to write, was the day I began in earnest to rethink what I was doing there. Then the directorship of the agency changed in May of 1974 because the National Federation of the Blind, NFB, the very group I had been led to mistrust throughout high school and beyond, made it happen. And I was unsure what to think. Dr. Nyman, the new director, was blind. He invited us to choose an agency to visit and bring back a report. I chose the Iowa Commission for the Blind, then run by Kenneth Jernigan, president of the NFB. In a meeting with Dr. Jernigan before leaving Iowa, I expressed to him how impressed I was with what was happening there and contrasted it with what I thought was happening here. After a brief silence, he asked me, and what are you doing about that? Embarrassed, but also energized, I realized it was time for me to engage. I returned to Nebraska determined to help to strengthen our affiliate of the NFB and to make changes in how our agency for the blind operated. The blind director at the helm was willing to allow us to spread our wings so we started with an orientation center modeled after the one in Iowa. When we asked that field staff work with people towards spending months with us, some balked, saying, I'll bring them, but it's your job to get them to stay. Young and inexperienced though we were, we did convince some to stay, and over time some of them became advocates for the changes. Although I resigned my position as supervisor of the Orientation Center in 1981 to raise my family, I continued to advocate for change for the agency through the NFB. Recognizing that the agency, then under the Department of Public Institutions, DPI, was restricted by policies created for agencies ranging from mental health to corrections, none of which aligned with what made sense for blind adults, we, the organized blind, began to work toward getting out from under that umbrella. This took a quarter of a century to accomplish and involved several starts and stops as we learned the nuts and bolts of the legislative process, who we could trust and who we couldn't, when to wait and when to push, etc. In the 1990s, consolidation, housing various entities under one roof so you can share everything from the building itself to the business office, 
and economy of scale, buying each item for less by buying them in bulk, were the order of the day. Despite our best efforts, the agency was swallowed by the health and human services system through what was called the Nebraska Partnership for Health and Human Services Act in 1996. Among other things, it ceased to have a dedicated business office, and many things were carried out using what was called soft money, which is, among other things, harder to trace and sometimes non-transferable. That became relevant when our efforts at last succeeded in 2000 and the agency became separate, freestanding, and led by a five-member commission board answerable directly to the governor. When that resulted in the loss of a considerable amount of what should have been transferred money, some despaired and thought we had made a mistake. Most rebounded, though, when the Commission was able to begin leveraging more money for blind people than was possible under any of the previous options. When the unicameral was considering placing a sunset clause on the bill that created NCBVI, that is, limiting the scope of the Commission's life to a specified time frame after which it would die unless it met specific criteria, State Senator Ernie Chambers said, in part, when you have a group who've had to struggle for so many years to even get a bill in this position before us, to be told now, after all of that struggle, well, yes, we think that you ought to regulate a commission that is going to look after your interests, but we don't trust you. So we're going to let you move forward, but we're going to keep you on a short leash. I don't think that's appropriate. And I don't think, when an operation of this kind is just starting out, that they should be under the pressure of feeling that they're going to have to satisfy a group of politicians in order to maintain themselves in existence. Mr. President, members of the legislature. I cannot thunder like the old prophet who said it, but he said, oh, that my head were water and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for my people. Were I blind, that's what I would be saying. Hit me again and I'll get up. I know I'm flat on my belly. I know society sees me as something strange. I cannot see them avert their eyes but I sense their uncomfortableness when I come around. So in order to get you to give me a chance to not creep and crawl on all fours when I also have two feet like you, I'll tell you what. I am so desirous of getting out of this creeping position, so desirous of standing on my feet like a human being, I will let you put an additional stone on me to give me that chance. So put a sunset on it. It's insulting, it's demeaning, but we've always been left on the outside. If the only way we have a chance to approach the door and have a possibility of entering it, hit me again, hit me again, harder, harder, but don't take away the chance. We ought to give these people a chance. And it should not always be we're giving you a chance, but you're as good as I am, except I think you're worthy of this. However, every condition that we impose, every qualification that we add, if we were to examine them, we see that each one diminishes the personhood and value of these individuals as human beings. It's not too much to let the blind lead the sighted when we're dealing with the issues that relate to the blind. We couldn't have said it better ourselves. And our commission bill passed without a sunset clause. So why should NCBVI partner with blind consumers? The short answer, and that's really all I have time for here, is that we are living the experience of blindness in our society. 
that we can hold the agency accountable in responding to that lived experience, and we can advocate for changes through laws and other avenues that may either be or be seen as conflicts of interest for those working for a government entity. We helped to cement this partnership by having the law creating the commission state that there would be a designee of two specific consumer organizations among the five people to be appointed to its board of commissioners. The National Federation of the Blind of Nebraska chose me to be its first designee, and I chaired the board from its inception until term limits ended my service in 2007. Bill Arrester served as the American Council of the Blind of Nebraska's first designee for that same period. Initially, in order to lay the foundation for the new agency, we evaluated the executive director on the following criteria, spelling the word blind. One, believing that it is respectable to be blind. Two, listening and responding to concerns from staff and consumers alike. Three, identifying priorities and seeing them through. Four, negotiating creatively to hire quality staff and fund exemplary service delivery. Five, dreaming progressive steps toward true equality for the blind. Although subsequent commission boards have adopted different evaluation tools, these expectations continue to live on in the mission statement the agency adopted in 2003. Empowering blind individuals, promoting opportunities, and building belief in the blind. Shortly after NCBVI came into being, a group of consumers worked with community leaders to form Friends of the Commission, a nonprofit organization created to enhance the Commission's work by providing funds for items and projects that benefit blind people but fall outside the agency's purview as a as prescribed by state and federal laws. I have served on the Friends Board since 2014. On September 22, 2000, Governor Mike Yo Johans, who had signed the law creating the commission on April 10th of that year, came to the center for a tour and to address the Board of Commissioners. He said, in part, I think one of the roles of Nebraska state government, probably government in general, is to make sure that we create the climate for individuals to achieve their maximum potential. I must admit, when I looked at the commission <coughs> bill, one of the things I wanted to figure out was, would it help? It's always a question of priorities. But I decided that the commission was a priority. Now, having said that, I will applaud you for being willing not only to educate me about the need for that, but to educate state senators. These things do not happen accidentally. They happen because people get engaged in the process and make the case that it's important. My hope is that this will create a new relationship between the blind community and the state of Nebraska, and a new generation of people who are achieving their maximum potential. Because after all, that is what this is all about. Yes, it is. And here we are, 20 years later, bearing the fruit of that labor. There have been ups and downs, but this work in progress is weathering even this current COVID-19 pandemic. We, both engaged consumers and dedicated staff, have every reason to celebrate today. We worked together to create a unique consumer-driven agency within state government and have sustained it for a fifth of a century so far. Why did we create the commission? And why should it partner with consumers? Because it's a win-win way to empower blind individuals 
promote opportunities, and build belief in the blind. With that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Fred Schroeder. He used to be the director, the executive director of the Commission for the Blind in New Mexico. When I came to America in 1989, I ended in New Mexico when he was director there. Before that, he was the president of the National Federation of the Blind of of New Mexico, and under his leadership, they were able to create the separate independent agency for the blind in New Mexico. And I heard a lot of the stories and the transformation they made in New Mexico. And then he became the director, and under his leadership, he orchestrated all those great changes. So I mentioned he was the one who also hired me in New Mexico. And then he went on to be the uh, commissioner, commissioner of RSA. But let me just stop there for a moment because in May of 1988, as I was getting ready for the summer program, I got a call, you know, and I answered as usual, Carlos Servan and this a person told me, is this Carlos? This is Dr. Van Zandt. And Dr. Schroeder gave me your name, and I got scared. I said, okay, what did Fred say to her about me? <laughs> well, she was looking for, for a deputy director, and that's how I was recruited. So I know Dr. Van Zandt, I think, is on the call. She is the one who hired me here, took the risk. Uh, under her leadership, I, I, I grew. And we became a separate agency for the blind when she was also a, a director. Um, just imagine somebody said, it was like changing tires while the car was moving. <laughs> and you just picture Pearl driving and getting out her arms and trying to change the tires. And for those of us who know Pearl, she's tough, especially when she drives. <laughs> So Pearl, thank, thanks for all your leadership. Uh, I hope you are enjoying your retirement. And with that, I'll go back to Dr. Schroeder. Dr. Schroeder is now the president of the World Blind Union, and he's going to address this audience. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. pleasure and honor to be with all of you this afternoon on this great occasion. I want to talk just a little bit about separate agencies for the blind and why they are so important. I, I won't give you lots of data, but I will tell you that all the way back into the 70s and maybe before the 1970s, there have been a number of studies that have looked at the question of whether blind agencies are more efficient, more effective in serving blind and visually impaired people than combined agencies. And from that time until the present, every study has concluded that the outcomes for blind and partially sighted people in uh, separate agencies for the blind are superior. At one time, I remember reading a statistic that at that time there were 25 separate agencies for the blind. And uh, so almost half of the state programs had separate agencies for the blind. I say almost half because at that time there were, I think, 81 or 82 agencies uh, because you have all the states and then you have the trust territories and the District of Columbia. So there were like 80, 80 81, 82 agencies at that time. And of the 25 agencies for the blind, the separate programs, they were responsible for placing 70%, 70% of all the closures of blind and low vision people in the preceding year. I said I won't give you a lot of data, but I'll give you just one more because I think it speaks to the quality that Commissioner Schultz was 
was discussing a few moments ago. Uh, Mississippi State University has done a lot of research into the question of the effectiveness of separate agencies for the blind. And there are many, many different ways you can look at the data, but one that leapt out at me is that people who are served through a separate agency for the blind are twice as likely to be self-supporting at closure. Twice as likely. That's a stunning statistic. But it speaks to what I consider to be the real heart of a separate program for the blind. And that is an agency that believes in blind people, invests in blind people, has high expectations, and puts those expectations into practice through the rehabilitation process. Nebraska has one of the very best orientation centers in the country. And an orientation center is an important part of a separate agency for the blind. As Carlos mentioned, I previously directed the New Mexico Commission for the Blind. And one of the first things we did when we were able to create a separate agency for the blind was we completely re revamped the training at the orientation center. We changed it to be one of high expectations, one that demanded of students that they become as proficient as they can possibly be. I bring this up because one of the things that we hear from some agencies is that because of the choice provisions in the Rehabilitation Act, students or, or blind consumers cannot be compelled to take all of the courses that are offered through the orientation center. Now, it is true that a consumer cannot be compelled to go to an orientation center. That's where choice comes in. But it is not true that if a student or a consumer elects to go to a center, that he or she has the right to say, well, I don't really care for cane travel. I think I'll just skip that course or I don't care for uh, computer technology, so I'll skip that course. I think the best analogy is a university. You can decide to go to a university or not go to a university. But if you go to the university, you do not have the right to say, I don't really care for this textbook. Uh, I think, I, think we should, I should use a different textbook, or I know my major requires biology, but I'm not interested in biology. It is at the program level where choice becomes a factor. I say that because comprehensive rehabilitation training for blind and partially sighted people is really fundamental, not only to improving skills, but positive attitudes about blindness. All of you know that we talk a lot about positive attitudes. And why do we talk about positive attitudes? Well, I think all of you would agree that it is not particularly hard to prepare a blind person to work. It's, it takes some time, it might take some training, some assistive technology, but it's not especially hard to prepare a blind person to work. But it is very hard to get the person accepted by an employer. Why? Well, it is because of society's low expectations, society's assumption that blind people are automatically incapable or at least significantly less capable than others. And part of the, pro the process of reshaping attitudes is to help people understand that we live in a society that has very low expectations for blind people. Or said more bluntly, Blind people experience discrimination, not discrimination based on hostility, but discrimination nevertheless. As many of you know, I worked at the Nebraska agency. I went there in 1978 to teach cane travel. In fact, Dr. Van Zant, when she was a staff trainee, was one of my students. And Pearl, I apologize for uh, probably all the mistakes I made but you turned out well in spite of me. Um, but I was there in 1978 and in 1980, 
I uh, wanted to move back to New Mexico. I was from New Mexico. And there was a position open for a teacher of blind children with the Albuquerque Public Schools. I applied for the position. I had a master's degree in special education. I had two years of teaching experience in Nebraska. I had very good recommendations. Uh, my academic record was good and so on. So I was called for an interview and I was very, very hopeful. Well, that was in August of 1980. And a few weeks later, the school year started and I had not been called. So I assumed that someone else got the job. Can you see anything? But it turns out that I was wrong. It turns out I was the only applicant and the school district literally decided they were better off with an empty chair than hiring a blind person as a teacher. That's discrimination. And it will crush the human spirit unless we help people understand that we are part of a minority group that experiences low expectations in a fundamental and systemic way and that to counter those low expectations, we need to build our internal confidence. And also we need to be part of the advocacy movement that demands equality, equality of opportunity for blind and low vision people. As I say, the, the statistics around separate agencies for the blind stand for themselves, they speak for themselves. But the heart behind it, I believe, is in the spirit that believes in blind people, that encourages blind people, that does not simply approach rehabilitation as addressing the functional aspects of blindness, but helps the individual consumer build his or her own expectations, develop positive attitudes about blindness, and develop the strength to be able to go out and meet the challenges of society. The Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired has done outstanding work over the years. I was hired by Dr. Nyman, and those of you who knew Dr. Nyman, you're very fortunate. He was, he was a wonderful man, a singular sort of fellow, as you might say. And then Dr. Van Zant came and she took the program and continued developing it. And uh, now we have Carlos Servan as the director and his job is the same as Pearl's and the same as Dr. Nyman's. That is to take the foundation and keep evolving, keep developing, keep expanding opportunities. I'm very pleased and proud to have been a part of this celebration and I wish you all the very best. want to say I'm, I'm very excited to be here I think as Commissioner of RSA and as a former partner for the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired but as a Nebraskan I truly appreciate the opportunity to join you in, in the celebration today uh, so much so that um, I actually put on a suit and tie for you today so um, so I, you know this year 2020 is really a big year for celebrations and as has been mentioned it's also the 100th anniversary of the Vocational Rehabilitation Program, which was established on June 2nd of 1920. And the 30th anniversary of ADA was this last weekend. Both these are very significant milestones for individuals with disabilities in our country. Um, but also, I think the connection between the two. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 includes Section 504 of the Rehab Act. And, and that laid the foundation for the expansion of civil rights that occurred under the ADA. So, and, and, and those are two significant pieces of legislation, but um, as if that weren't significant enough, we're also celebrating the 20th anniversary of the creation of the Commission for the Blind and Individually Impaired and, um, and your independence, so to speak. So, what I really appreciate is through the work that you do, you embody the promise of the Rehab Act and the ADA. And, and that you continue to empower those you serve by bringing opportunity for their full integration into society 
into competitive integrated employment, independence, and self-sufficiency. So congratulations on leading the way and being a part of making a difference in the lives of people with disabilities. Um, so I, I do want to um, just touch a little bit over the accomplishments of the past 100 years. Um, so starting in year one, um, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go through year by year. Um, things began with the passage of the Smith Fess Act, and vocational rehabilitation started out primarily serving individuals with physical disabilities at that time. But there were no provisions for serving individuals who were blind or visually impaired, because at the time the notion was is that individuals who were blind or visually impaired couldn't work. Um, it wasn't until 1936, with the passage of the Randolph Shepard Act. Um, Act, as you know, created the program that continues today to provide blind entrepreneurs a priority uh, to operate any facilities in federal buildings. And then in 1943, the Barton La Follette Act made significant changes to the VR program. It expanded services that can be provided, but it also created separate agencies to serve people who are blind. So, Thus, it created the opportunity for um, the commission to be possible and for the celebration today. The Rehabilitation Act replaced the VR Act in 1973, and that brought more significant changes to the VR program. And that included prioritizing serving people with the most significant disabilities, implementing greater consumer involvement in the VR process, and it also provided the seed for independent living centers because it made the shift from the medical model um, that was being followed at the time to one being based on major life functions and informed choice for individuals with disabilities. And then as we said, in 1990, the ADA was signed into law. Um, and most recently in 2014, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act or WIOA was passed and that went into effect. So I'm gonna talk a little more about that impact in just a few minutes. But I, I just wanna to touch on the current situation. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we're faced with more change, right? All of us are having to rethink how we best prepare, how we expand opportunities, um, and envision the work, uh, the future work of people with disabilities at a time where there's a lot of uncertainty. And so what I really want to recognize is how VR programs across the country have been responding with innovative and creative strategies to continue to provide services. Um, training continues through remote technology. So just, just as we're using technology today um, and the move to telework, I think has created opportunities for individuals that might have struggled in a traditional work environment. So I think we, we try to look for the silver lining um, where we can, right? And, and take advantage of the opportunities that exist. And, and that's always been a strength of the VR program. So before I even got to RSA, um, RSA was starting to rethink about VR performance. How could we continue to improve the program? How could we evolve due to the changing times around us? And so there were some priorities established. Um, the first priority was around performance data. And as, so I wanna share a little bit about some of the accomplishments that are occurring and the progress that's been made around these priorities. So the first one was around performance data. Um, as I said, and, and a, a performance data work group was established. And RSA is working with VR agencies so that we can create a shared vision of what success looks like for VR programs, making sure that VR agencies have the tools that can assist them with data analysis or program evaluation uh, to build off of data and use it to improve uh, program performance. But um, most importantly, to create a vision, again, of that, what, what, given the performance measures that we have, do they need to be adjusted? Do we need to adapt them for the environment that we're working in now? Do they really reflect what we think is quality employment for individuals with disabilities? What is meaningful employment? And so I'm excited about the work of this work because they are looking to come up with some suggestions for how we might improve the data that we collect to really measure the value of the program. The second priority is providing flexibility and reducing burden. So, as you know, we made some progress there, right? So we had the notice of interpretations that came out around prior approval and reemployment transition services to create more flexibility for programs. And those flexibilities are in place now, even though we continue 
um, to work on our responses to the comments that we received during the process and finalize those, but um, you already have the flexibilities, they exist. In addition, um, we've looked at the current environment around COVID-19 and know that there's even more flexibility that's required right now to help states. And in the Secretary's report to Congress in terms of what authority and what waivers are necessary, the Secretary requested the waiver to set aside the 15, or to waive the 15% set aside for pre-employment uh, transition services. Um, and, and that's due to the impact of COVID-19, but only for this period of the national emergency. You think there needs to be some more flexibility because of the limited access that you have to students. Uh, even though I know there's work to be done, there's still um, it's difficult to be able to work with businesses to create those opportunities for work-based learning and for those uh, work experiences. So we're trying to create some flexibility. And so we're hopeful that Congress will listen and that in the upcoming bill that that might be included in. The third priority is around technical assistance and dis dissemination. And I'm excited to share with you, and some of you may already know this, is that the notice inviting applications for the technical assistance centers went out for public inspection yesterday and will soon be published in the Federal Register. It focuses on two centers, one around quality management and the other around quality employment. The quality employment Really, I think we've been doing a lot of things to put into place strategies that move us in that direction, but this really it will provide technical assistance to focus on evidence-based strategies, and those services that lead to better paying jobs, uh, better pathways, for example. But if you're gonna use those strategies before you even get to those, usually leadership and decision makers have to make that decision. Um, so the other center around quality management will be providing support to leadership and decision makers so that they can have the knowledge, um, the data, and the understanding about those so that they can make good choices about programmatic and, and fiscal decisions. The technical assistance centers will then be providing that intensive TA uh, to support states in, in the hopes that we can improve the quality of the services, but also the quality of VR programs overall. And, and, and that hopefully will lead to quality employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities. The fourth priority is around monitoring. And some of you may know that there was a tremendous backlog in terms of our reports back to states that we had previously been on site and conducted monitoring. And there was a two year backlog. And we were on track to get all those previous monitoring reports out until COVID-19 hit. And we had to reprioritize. But just last week, we notified selected programs of our intent to begin the monitoring process again. So we intend to not just look at compliance, but really focus on technical assistance that um, where we can provide and connect programs to the technical assistance, including the technical assistance centers, so that we're truly supporting program improvement. Um, so that they're providers of quality services that are meaningful to individuals with disabilities. So, uh, that will be more so the focus, even though compliance is an important thing, we're supporting you and all programs to be of quality for the individuals that we serve. In addition, we have a work group that was established and it's comprised again of representatives from the other agencies that's working on recommendations for future monitoring and how we can make this process um, more meaningful for you and ensure that it leads to quality improvement in the service of the state. The fifth priority is around communication. And um, even though it hasn't stopped us from making some progress in this area, COVID-19 certainly has an impact on how we go about doing it. Um, we can, we've established quarterly meetings with all our programs so that we're keeping in touch and providing you information and being transparent about what's really going on as much as we can. And then in addition, we are holding periodic webinars around specific topics to provide more information and guidance to the state. But what I hope you've seen um, in Nebraska is that we really have focused on elevating the visibility of the VR program over this last year, because the 100th anniversary created a prime opportunity for us to be able to do that. So we've been doing that both in DC but also nationally as we hold these webinars and, and celebrate the 
program partnerships that we have to celebrate the success stories that we've been able to achieve and really, as I said, increase the visibility and build out tape programs and stories that really show that we're making a difference in the lives of them across the country. In addition, um, many states have adopted the materials and have done similar activities with the state that we would be um, purpose, the message, and the value of the VR program across the country. So very excited about that. So, so the, within those five priorities, I feel our, we've made you know, significant progress. Um, so just for a few seconds, I also want to touch on the Randolph Shepherd program, because I know that's of particular interest uh, to you, uh, Carlos, and the commission. And just to demonstrate the value of the program overall, and, and this is not the most current data, but it's the latest data that, that was provided to me, but the gross sales across the country, um, and this is 2018 data, was over $665 million. And of that amount, the total vendor earnings was just over $120 million. So if you think about the number of vendors that there are across the country, which is um, just over 1,800 vendors, that average income is $66,000 a year. Well, that's a pretty good wage, and, and, and the Randolph Shepherd program is a very good revenue stream for um, creating those jobs and opportunities for individuals to serve, particularly those who are gone. So, uh, we, we, when I came into the program, we knew that we were struggling, um, Randolph Shepherd, to be responsive to agencies and vendors across the country, and so. We've done some things to change that. We've added three new employees to uh, the Randolph Shepherd team over the last year. And in addition, the Office of General Counsel has added one additional attorney to be able to expedite the process and to assist us in making inroads on the backlog that's occurred. So with that additional staff, we've really made good progress. And, and right now, I would like to say we've, we've caught up with the backlog and we're able to work on those current requests that come in and issues that arise. So uh, we've done a great job there, I think, to the point where we've also began monitoring some of the Randolph Shepherd programs because of the first we cut it off. Um, this last year, we undertook monitoring for three programs. And again, COVID-19 has interfered with that a little bit, but we've gone out there with the intent that it's not just about compliance, but we're really looking to improve the program performance and again utilize more of our technical assistance tools or the partnership approach as we look to improve the quality of services uh, in the Randolph Shepherd program as well. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about within the Randolph Shepherd program is the addition of conflict resolution. Uh, we have an experienced staff person in conflict resolution and she's uh, already been involved with I think two or three programs or state um, where she's been able to facilitate communication between um, vendors and the state licensing agency and been able to reconcile some of the issues um, so that we're saving um, the stress, the time, and frankly, the resources, the financial resources um, that the arbitration process would require. So I've been very excited about that, and I hope that uh, we're able to utilize that more as we go into the future. Um, I also want to recognize the fact that COVID-19 has had a real impact on vendors. Um, in many of the federal facilities, they've had to close for a period of time. And even now, when many workers are teleworking, um, there's not quite the traffic within some of those facilities as there was in the past. So the revenue stream is significantly decreased. Right now, before um, Congress, um, the Secretary's waiver request, we put forward recommendation that a waiver be granted to allow for the use of VR funds so that we, they could be used to restock vending facilities to be able to assist reestablishing these sites. Um, so we're still waiting for Congress to act on that. And again, hopeful that we'll see more within the bill, um, the bills and the final bill as it goes forward. But I just want to share a couple other things before I conclude. And, while we, while we continue to think about VR performance, uh, we're also aware of other trends that we're seeing in the data. And some of these have been mentioned in our report to Congress on the impact of WIOA on the programs. And that was submitted several months ago. 
Um, so let me, I'm just gonna run through a few numbers here and I'll go through them very quickly. But the number of applicants um, over a 10 year period is significantly increased. In 2010, there were seven, over 700,000 individuals um, that applied to the DR program. And in 2019, which is the latest set of data, it was 446,000 individuals that applied. Very significant. At the same time, those individuals who were eligible increased from 693,000 to 399,000 in that period of time. So that's almost a, that's almost a 50% decrease over that period of time. And then individuals that exited with employment and outcome went up from a high of, went from a high of 179,000 in 2016 it's fallen to 142,000. So about a 37,000 um, decrease in terms of the number of individuals exiting with um, an outcome, a successful outcome. Of the so that again is another significant drop. The rehab rate went from a high of around 57% in 2016 to 45.5% in 2019. So a lot of that, um, may have been impacted by changes in WIOA. And so if we look at the requirement around pre-employment transition services specifically, we can see an increase in program years 2017 to 2018, we went from 179,000 to 248,000 students that were receiving pre-employment transition services. We also saw a similar increase from 85,000 to 137,000 for those students um, or who were potentially eligible for the program. So overall, the students who applied for VR services and were receiving pre employment transition services increased by 17% in just that one year period of time. That's had a significant impact on how the VR program went. Um, when we look overall at who was serving, the number of participants who were 24 and younger um, is over 50% right now. So when we think about us being an adult program, that's changed. The majority of individuals being served are 24 and younger. So that has significant implications for the VR program. So I just want to share a few other statistics here that are specific to um, blind VR agencies. So if we look at the number of students with disabilities that were reported, um, in 2017 and 2018, and compare those numbers, we went from 525,000 to, to, to 638,000 over that one year period across all VR agencies. For blind VR agencies, 8,889 students were served in 2017. That had a slight decrease to 8,511 in 2018. And we saw a similar trend for the number of potentially students with disabilities being served. There was a decrease um, in the blind VR agency for students who were being served versus in, uh, in general for all VR agencies. Uh, the number of participants exiting with employment, as I mentioned earlier, for all VR agencies, there was a decrease from 152,000 to 142,000 in just the last year. That was a 6%, 6.4% decrease. Well, for blind VR agency, we went from 3,887 down to 3,409. That's a 12.3% decrease, almost twice as much as for um, uh, overall for VR agency. So that's, a, that's a very significant impact. Um, so I, I can't tell you exactly why, it's just that's what the data is, and I think we have to acknowledge it and we have to address it and figure out how we can um, how we can manage that better. So um, what we're seeing with the trends, I think they make clear that following the implement implementation of WIOA, um, VR agencies are serving significantly um, more students and with disabilities as compared to before WIOA. Uh, before WIOA, I think that the, we were the 24 and younger, we were serving about 30%. And as I said, now we're up over 50%. So that requires that those funds used to provide pre-employment transition services um, 
is going to mean that there are fewer resources available to serve adults with disabilities. Um, we're also seeing an impact around Section 511 and, and the, the need to serve more individuals with significant disabilities and the significant amount of time and resources that are necessary in order to assist those individuals into the competitive integrated employment. So those trends um, are contributing to fewer individuals achieving employment outcomes. So I think we need to acknowledge that data. And again, we need to know how to uh, address it. What changes? How do we evolve as VR programs across the country to be able to effectively provide services um, and to get our story out and our message that we, we continue um, to provide quality employment services for everyone that comes in, but the demographics has changed in terms of who we serve. So I, I do want to share that uh, even with these numbers, there's still continued support for the VR programs by administration and Congress. And this, we've seen that within the budget request um, where the funding levels have stayed the same. There are no cuts anticipated at this point in time. So I just want to conclude by saying we take what we learn from our history, from the data that I shared to you, um, the experiences we're having today with COVID-19, and we need to use those to continue to evolve into a program that's preparing us all for the future, whatever it may be. Um, and before I go, I just want to say that we need to embrace the great work of those who have come before us, um, because the progress we're making is because we stand in the shoulders of those individuals. Um, so for the commission over the years, I just want to say I, I've really had the the opportunity and the privilege to be able to work with many great leaders. So I think back about Dr. James Nyman, um, Dr. Pro Van Zandt, and, and now Carlos. Um, and so I would just like to, to thank you, Carlos, your staff, um, and, and past leadership for, for that leadership and their dedication um, to serve individuals who are blind and visually impaired. So, um, you know, while we're facing unprecedented challenges, Right now, because of the times, um, we continue to respond with innovative strategies and creative delivery and support. Um, we continue to adapt and continue to make changes. Um, but one thing I hope never changes, and that's the basic purpose of our programs at VR. To help students, youth, and adults with disabilities achieve high quality employment. And by that, I mean high quality employment outcomes that they choose and which allow them to reach to the extent that they desire their highest career goals and their fullest potential. So at the state and federal level, we're going to continue to work to improve the VR program uh, during the next 100 years. I, I probably won't be here for that full time, <laughs> um, but that should be our goal, right? To continue and continually improve, to continue to evolve. So I want to thank you on behalf of RSA and myself for the great work that's being done at the commission. Um, and that you continue to do, and for allowing me to be a, a part of your celebration. So, thank you. What I like most about being a commissioner and the chair is I get a front row seat to see and hear what's going on, and and I tell you, it's it's been amazing what has gone on. Uh, the subject of my presentation or talk today is uh, where we are now and where we're going to go in the future. And I came up with a quote that it says, uh, where we are is where we are, but what, it, what matters most is where we're going in the future or what's next. And uh, as, a, as the board chair, as a um, blind person, as a uh, taxpayer, I would suggest strongly that the Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired is exactly where it needs to be. Um, we, when I say we, I, I, uh, the, the Commission for the Blind has high expectations on what blind people can do. And they have the expertise 
and the personnel to prepare blind people to be successful. We know how to use technology. You know, I've looked at the history of blindness and there's never been a better time to be blind than there is right now with what we have in services and technology. Um, we've talked about this, but we have a separate agency and that is so critical. Um, if we were to be in a combined agency, we would tend to fall towards the bottom. And with the separate agency, the blind are all giving a, given a fair opportunity. So how did, you, how did we get to where we are today and why is that so good? I, first, I think we need to recognize that we have, have a very supportive state legislature that gives us the funding that we need. Now, Nebraska is known for being kind of conservative, but we're also known as being wise. And our legislators know that it's an investment. And when we invest in blind people, they succeed and it's a great return for our society. We have a very good leadership team. Uh, Carlos, I can't tell you how much I've grown to respect Carlos. I went through the hiring process and it, I didn't really realize what a, how knowledgeable he was and what a great leader he was until I compared him to his peers. And he rose to the top quickly and uh, he continues to surprise me daily. We have, and it's, we have a young leadership team. We have uh, an executive director that uh, is, she is a tireless worker. We have a, a financial person that just knows how to make the numbers work and, and how to keep track of things. But what I think is most important, and I haven't heard it said enough, but I'm going to say it a lot, it's a dedicated staff and capable staff that we have. They not only are dedicated and capable, they are caring. And uh, there's a quote, uh, that um, kindness is a language that blind people can see and the deaf can hear. And as blind people, we, we definitely see the, the dedicated and caring staff that we have. And I wish I could mention them all. I'm just going to, because you all matter so much, I'm going to go just in Omaha. You've got Tim Jefferson, we've got Kelly Coleman, we've got Kathy Brown, and, and Nancy Floro as supervisors. I'm in Omaha, so I know you people, but the people <coughs> in Lincoln are, have just the same sentiment, and Norfolk, and all the different areas. Uh, this, whatever's been done has been done because of the dedicated staff that we have. They, they make it work every day. Uh, and again, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I hope some of you are on the, the, the Zoom today, but uh, there's a lot of blind people that wouldn't be where they are today without you. Uh, I talked about high expectations, but it's, it's all about high expectations. <clears throat> And uh, Nebraska is known for successful outcomes because they have high expectations. Um, community, uh, consumer groups are, have played a very important role. And I can tell you, uh, the NFB and the ACB, uh, yeah, we disagree on some things, but we, we agree on a lot of things. And, in recent years when we went legislatively, we worked together because uh, Helen Keller said together we can do so much. Well, alone we can do so little and together we can do so much. And I, I think they have both done an outstanding job. Um, you know, we, we, now we have funds for older blind people. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I don't know how many years ago it was, but we went and sought additional funding from the state. And we essentially tripled our budget. And how we were able to sell that was is when older blind people live independent, they can remain in their homes 
and they, they don't end up in expensive nursing homes or assisted living. So talk about a great investment. And I think there's a lot of other states that are going to hopefully follow our lead because uh, uh, it, it, it is awesome. And I, I, it's so nice. I, I meet so many older blind people, and now I can say, hey, you know, we have the financial resources to help you stay independent. And, uh, and uh, so that is just awesome. We have a very excellent center for the blind. It's nationally recognized. Uh, I can tell people with confidence if they go through the center and they complete it, they will be successful. And the statistics statistics support that and uh, the jobs and the money they make support that. We have many, many, many success stories. When we go to the legislature and ask for money, we've got, we, we don't have to look and coach people what they say. Their hearts just pour out and say, this is what the, the Nebraska Commission for the Blind has done in my <laughs> life. And sometimes it's not just the blind individual. It might be the parent or the daughter of that blind person. But the work that, the work that is being done matters. And then um, we just create jobs. You know, we help people find jobs. And, you know, it's, uh, it's about preparing and placing blind people for jobs. We wouldn't be in the business. We wouldn't get the funding that we have if we didn't have a good track record. And uh, the Nebraska Commission for the Blind has had a, a good track record on kind of being a leader and an innovator. Uh, they have long before Workforce Initiative Opportunities Act was enacted, they were doing things because they recognized that, that we need to work with uh, blind youth and trans transition them to successful adults. And they, they do wages, they do winter fest, and they do different things. So I, at this point, I just want to say today's a great reason to celebrate. Uh, we have gone so far, not just in the 20 years, but in the last 100 years. And, and I don't know all the history, but I, I know where we're at now. And I think uh, people that are in Nebraska, especially the blind people, are very fortunate. Now, the, I'm going to talk about the future, and I, I'm kind of been chuckling to myself because I haven't talked to Carlos about this, so he's probably holding his breath, wondering where does this crazy guy think that we're going to go. But I know Carlos, and I know that he cares deeply about blind, blind people. He knows what they can do, and I hope that I have that same desire that he does. So I think, I think he's going to be okay with what I say. And I think, here's just some things that I think we must do. We must always, always uh, show respect to the consumers that we're serving. We have people that come from all kinds of different lives and we've done it in the past, but we need to continue to do it in the future. We need, uh, we need a positive place to work where the, the staff people are reminded that the work that they do matters. They need the, uh, to be empowered to do their jobs. They need to be heard because they're the ones that are getting the information in the field. And they, we just, we need to take care of our staff people. We must, uh, do uh, a great job of promoting our agency. Sometimes I think uh, we're the best kept secret in Nebraska. And how we do that is we con continue to create success stories. Um, and we need to, it's to me, I'm kind of a numbers guy, but it's all about placing and preparing people to work. If we don't do that, we're, we're, we're missing the mark. So we must, we must, you know, uh, continue to place people and we need to, we need to do better. We need to have uh, 
better outcomes. We need to learn what to do, what not to do. We need to seek out um, the best possible information and resources that we have. Uh, yesterday I was listening to the uh, funeral of uh, John Lewis and John Lewis uh, was a great man. He was a great, great uh, visionary and um, and I think he's, he, has, he served the country so well. Uh, one thing I heard, it, th there were lots of wonderful things that were said, but the one thing that just startled me a little bit is we need to be careful not just to ask the questions where we know the answers. I heard uh, his, one of his aides saying that John never asked a question and he didn't know the answer. And, and he did that because he, he, he wanted to show his how intelligent he is and how thoughtful he was and how prepared he was, but we need to ask, we need to continually ask questions, but sometimes we need to find new answers and we need to be talking to people. If we don't meet the needs of the, the clients that we serve, they won't come. So we need to continually seek new ways, new, new ideas, and whatever we need to do to make blind people want to come and want to be successful. And how we do that is by creating success stories and more success stories. Uh, we need to be flexible. We need to be creative. Uh, consumer groups continue to have a, we need to continuously work with consumer groups. Uh, here in the state of Nebraska, it's no secret that there's two consumer groups and this is a more of an NFB state. And that, you know, there's other states you could say well, Missouri is more of an ACB state. But I can assure you that uh, because we are a consumer group driven agency, I have never once felt like ACB was ever short, shorted or disrespected in any way. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, being on the board as an ACB person, and uh, and uh, it's just you, you do you guys truly do care about the the blind and consumer groups. We still have a job to do. Sometimes we'll work together. Hopefully, when it's important, and uh, we're going to uh, have more legislative issues in the future. Another thing that we definitely need to do, and this this goes to consumer groups, is we may have to fight for what we've already got because uh, we live in different times and uh, we need to continually reinforce how, how much the Commission for the Blind matters and how successful it's been. And uh, I think lastly I would say we need to learn from other agencies but probably more importantly we need to share what we do with other agencies because what we do helps blind people and I think in some way we want to help the people that are blind in Nebraska but we also we want to share that success uh, nationwide and Well, thank you, Mark, for your for your remarks. Indeed, I agree with everything you, you say. I, you, you could tell me I don't have a choice. <laughs> no, but it's nice to know that we all share the same principles and dreams. I just want to end by thank you, thank you all of you for being here, for being part of this ceremony. And I also know that you know that we are celebrating not just today, but we continue to celebrate every day for the work everybody else does here. Somebody <clears throat> sometimes one time said that there are different ways why we study history. And one of the reasons why we study history is because we want to become mature. Now we have to be able to look at the past to know where, where we are now. Barbara summarized that, if all the struggles in a very nice way, what we are now, 
So we need to know everything we did in the past to be strong today and to be able to shape our future. And what I can tell you is we are going to have a great future as long as the agency partners with consumers and continues building the capability of our staff members. We wouldn't be able to be where we are without the quality, the passion that our staff members have. When I talk to Carol Jenkins, she's the deputy director for all services, and Kat, deputy director for finances, how do we get to this goal? I don't hear from them complaints. They say, okay, let's think about it, let's do it. When they talk to their staff, same thing. When I attend the supervisor's meeting, this is where we need to go. I don't hear people saying, no, we cannot do it. They check with the staff members. They're all happy, all innovated, or they, they like those challenges because they believe on blind people. And I think starting with that premise that blind people are competent, the rest is a matter of imagination and hard work, and that's what, what our staff members do. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think I want to thank you again, and thanks everybody in the public and Zoom for being here. I understand the speeches were recorded right, we're going to be saving it, and hopefully share with whoever wants to read it or listening it again. Thank you all. Do we still have enough for drinks available for people? First floor. Okay. So you guys hear that those who want some snacks, I think Jim didn't have lunch and I could hear his stomach rumbling. <laughs>